Hey everyone, this is Kevin from Data School. Today you're gonna to learn my top 25 pandas tricks. These are the best tricks I've learned from five years of teaching pandas. These tricks will help you to work faster, write better code, and impress your friends. Here's everything you're gonna learn. There's also a bonus at the end of this video that you're not gonna to wanna to miss. Now before we start, I'm gonna import pandas and numpy. I'm also gonna read in some data sets that we'll use as examples. Now I'll be moving quickly, but you can download this notebook from the link in the description below if you wanna follow along. Let's get going. Trick number one, show installed versions. Uh, sometimes you need to know the pandas version you're using, especially when reading the pandas documentation. You can show the pandas version by typing pd dot underscore underscore version underscore underscore. But if you also need to know the versions of pandas dependencies, you can use the show versions function. You can see the versions of Python, Pandas, NumPy, Matplotlib, and more. Thanks to Harvey Summers for this trick. Trick number two, create an example data frame. Let's say that you want to demonstrate some pandas code. You'll need an example data frame to work with. There are many ways to do this, but my favorite way is to pass a dictionary to the data frame constructor in which the dictionary keys are the column names and the dictionary values are lists of column values. Now, if you need a much larger data frame, the above method will require way too much typing. In that case, you can use NumPy's random.rand function, tell it the number of rows and columns, and pass that to the data frame constructor. Now that's pretty good, but if you also want non-numeric column names, you can course a string of letters to a list and then pass that list to the columns parameter. As you might guess, your string will need to have the same number of characters as there are columns. Trick number three, rename columns. Let's take a look at the example data frame we created in the last trick. I prefer to use dot notation to select pandas columns, but that won't work since the column names have spaces. Let's fix this. The most flexible method for renaming columns is the rename method. You pass it a dictionary in which the keys are the old names and the values are the new names, and you also specify the axis. The best thing about this method is that you can use it to rename any number of columns, whether it be just one column or all columns. Now, if you're gonna rename all of the columns at once, a simpler method is just to overwrite the columns attribute of the data frame. Now, if the only thing you're doing is replacing spaces with underscores, an even better method is to use the stir.replace method since you don't have to type out all of the column names. All three of these methods have the same result, which is to rename the columns so that they don't have any spaces. Finally, if you just need to add a prefix or suffix to all of your column names, you can use the add prefix method or the add suffix method. Trick number four, reverse row order. Let's take a look at the drinks data frame. This is a data set of average alcohol consumption by country. What if you wanted to reverse the order of the rows? The most straightforward method is to use the loc accessor and pass it colon colon negative one, which is the same slicing notation used to reverse a Python list. What if you also wanted to reset the index so that it starts at zero? You would use the reset index method and tell it to drop the old index entirely. As you can see, the rows are in reverse order, but the index has been reset to the default integer index. Trick number five, reverse column order. Similar to the previous trick, you can also use loc to reverse the left to right order of your columns. 
the colon before the comma means select all rows, and the colon colon negative one after the comma means reverse the columns, which is why country is now on the right side. Trick number six, select columns by data type. Here are the data types of the drinks data frame. Now let's say that you need to select only the numeric columns. You can use the select dtypes method. This includes both the int and float columns. You could also use this method to select just the object columns. You can tell it to include multiple data types by passing a list. You can also tell it to exclude certain data types. Thanks to Vikram Lucky for this trick. Trick number seven, convert strings to numbers. Let's create another example data frame. Now these numbers are actually stored as strings, which results in object columns. In order to do mathematical operations on these columns, we need to convert the data types to numeric. You can use the as type method on the first two columns. However, this would have resulted in an error if you tried to use it on the third column because that column contains a dash to represent zero and pandas doesn't understand how to handle it. Instead, you can use the toNumeric function on the third column and tell it to convert any invalid input into NaN values. If you know that the NaN values actually represent zeros, you can fill them with zeros using the fillNa method. Finally, you can apply this function to the entire data frame all at once by using the apply method. This one line of code accomplishes our goal because all of the data types have now been converted to float. Thanks to Chris Moffitt for this trick. Trick number eight, reduce data frame size. Pandas data frames are designed to fit into memory, and so sometimes you need to reduce the data frame size in order to work with it on your system. Here's the size of the drinks data frame. You can see that it currently uses 30.4 kilobytes. If you're having performance problems with your data frame, or you can't even read it into memory, there are two easy steps you can take during the file reading process to reduce the data frame size. The first step is to only read in the columns that you actually need, which we specify with the use calls parameter. By only reading in those two columns, we've reduced the data frame size to 13.6 kilobytes. The second step is to convert any object columns containing categorical data to the category data type, which we specify with the dtype parameter. By reading in the continent column as the category data type, we further reduce the data frame size to 2.3 kilobytes. Keep in mind that the category data type will only reduce memory usage if you have a small number of categories relative to the number of rows. Trick number nine, build a data frame from multiple files row-wise. Let's say that your data set is spread across multiple files, but you want to read the data set into a single data frame. For example, I have a small data set of stock data in which each CSV only includes a single day. Here's the first day. Here's the second day. And here's the third day. You could read each CSV file into its own data frame, combine them together, and then delete the original data frames, but that would be memory inefficient and require a lot of code. A better solution is to use the built-in glob module. You can pass a pattern to glob, including wildcard characters, and it will return a list of all files that match that pattern. In this case, glob is looking in the data subdirectory for all CSV files that start with the word stocks. Glob returns file names in an arbitrary order, which is why we sorted the list using Python's built-in sorted function. We can then use a generator expression to read each of the files using read CSV and pass the results to the concat function, which will concatenate the rows into a single data frame. Unfortunately, there are now duplicate values in the index. 
To avoid that, we can tell the concat function to ignore the index and instead use the default integer index. Thanks to Dinesh Nair and Davis Vickers for this trick. Trick number 10, build a data frame for multiple files column-wise. The previous trick is useful when each file contains rows from your data set. But what if each file instead contains columns from your data set? Here's an example in which the drinks data set has been split into two CSV files and each file contains three columns. Similar to the previous trick, we'll start by using glob. And this time, we'll tell the concat function to concatenate along the columns axis. Now our data frame has all six columns. Trick number 11, create a data frame from the clipboard. Let's say that you have some data stored in an Excel spreadsheet or a Google Sheet and you want to get it into a data frame as quickly as possible. Just select the data and copy it to the clipboard. Then you can use the read clipboard function to read it into a data frame. Just like read CSV, read clipboard automatically detects the correct data type for each column. Let's copy one other data set to the clipboard. Amazingly, Pandas has even identified the first column as the index. Keep in mind that if you want your work to be reproducible in the future, read clipboard is not the recommended approach. Thanks to Priya Ranjan Mohanty for this trick. Trick number 12, split a data frame into two random subsets. Let's say that you want to split a data frame into two parts, randomly assigning 75% of the rows to one data frame and the other 25% to a second data frame. For example, we have a data frame of movie ratings with 979 rows. We can use the sample method to randomly select 75% of the rows and assign them to the movie's one data frame. Then we can use the drop method to drop all rows that are in Movies 1 and assign the remaining rows to Movies 2. You can see that the total number of rows is correct. And you can see from the index that every movie is in either Movies 1 or Movies 2. Keep in mind that this approach will not work if your index values are not unique. Trick number 13, filter a data frame by multiple categories. Let's take a look at the movies data frame. One of the columns is genre. If we wanted to filter the data frame to only show movies with the genre action or drama or western, we could use multiple conditions separated by the OR operator. However, you can actually rewrite this code more clearly by using the isIn method and passing it a list of genres. And if you want to reverse the filter so that you are excluding rather including those three genres, you can put a tilde in front of the condition. This works because tilde is the not operator in Python. Trick number 14, filter a data frame by largest categories. Let's say that you needed to filter the movie's data frame by genre, but only include the three largest genres. We'll start by taking the value counts of genre and saving it as a series called counts. The series method n largest makes it easy to select the three largest values in the series. And all we actually need from the series is the index. Finally, we can pass the index object to isIn and it will be treated like a list of genres. Thus, only drama and comedy and action movies remain in the data frame. Trick number 15, handle missing values. 
Let's look at a data set of UFO sightings. You'll notice that some of the values are missing. To find out how many values are missing in each column, you can use the isNA method and then take the sum. isNA generated a data frame of true and false values, and sum converted all of the true values to one and added them up. Similarly, you can find out the percentage of values that are missing by taking the mean of isNA. If you want to drop the columns that have any missing values, you can use the dropNA method. Or if you want to drop columns in which more than 10% of the values are missing, you can set a threshold for dropNA. Len of UFO returns the total number of rows, and then we multiply that by 0.9 to tell pandas only to keep the columns in which at least 90% of the values are not missing. Thanks to Ratan Rohith and Joannis Medina Beta for this trick. Trick number 16, split a string into multiple columns. Let's create another example data frame. What if we wanted to split the name column into three separate columns for first, middle, and last name? We would use the stir.split method and tell it to split on a space character and expand the results into a data frame. These three columns can actually be saved to the original data frame in a single assignment statement. Now what if we wanted to split a string, but only keep one of the resulting columns? For example, let's split the location column on comma space. If we only cared about saving the city name in column zero, we can just select that column and save it to the data frame. Thanks to Daniel Kim and Emmanuel Amusen for this trick. Trick number 17, expand a series of lists into a data frame. Let's create another example data frame. There are two columns, and the second column contains regular Python lists of integers. If we wanted to expand the second column into its own data frame, we can use the apply method on that column and pass it the series constructor. And by using the concat function, you can combine the original data frame with the new data frame. Trick number 18, aggregate by multiple functions. Let's look at a data frame of orders from the Chipotle restaurant chain. Each order has an order ID and consists of one or more rows. To figure out the total price of an order, you sum the item price for that order ID. For example, here's the total price of order number one. If you wanted to calculate the total price of every order, you would group by order ID and then take the sum of item price for each group. However, you're not actually limited to aggregating by a single function such as sum. To aggregate by multiple functions, you use the ag method and pass it a list of functions such as sum and count. This gives us the total price of each order as well as the number of items in each order. Trick number 19, combine the output of an aggregation with a data frame. Let's take another look at the orders data frame. What if we wanted to create a new column listing the total price of each order? Recall that we calculated the total price using the sum method. Sum is an aggregation function, which means that it returns a reduced version of the input data. In other words, the output of the sum function is smaller than the input to the function. The solution is to use the transform method, which performs the same calculation, but returns output data that is the same shape as the input data. We'll store the results in a new data frame column called total price. As you can see, the total price of each order is now listed on every single line. That makes it easy 
to calculate the percentage of the total order price that each line represents. Thanks to Chris Moffitt for this trick. Trick number 20, select a slice of rows and columns. Let's take a look at another data set. This is the famous Titanic data set, which shows information about passengers on the Titanic and whether or not they survived. If you wanted a numerical summary of the data set, you would use the describe method. However, the resulting data frame might be displaying more information than you need. If you wanted to filter it to only show the five number summary, you can use the loc accessor and pass it a slice of the min through the max row labels. And if you're not interested in all of the columns, you can also pass it a slice of column labels. Thanks to Alexandru Mercea for this trick. Trick number 21, reshape a multi-indexed series. The Titanic dataset has a survived column made up of ones and zeros, so you can calculate the overall survival rate by taking the mean of that column. If you wanted to calculate the survival rate by a single category, such as sex, you would use a group by. And if you wanted to calculate the survival rate across two different categories at once, you would group by both of those categories. This shows the survival rate for every combination of sex and passenger class. It's stored as a multi-indexed series, meaning that it has multiple index levels to the left of the actual data. It can be hard to read and interact with data in this format, so it's often more convenient to reshape a multi-index series into a data frame by using the unstack method. This data frame contains the same exact data as the multi-indexed series, except that now you can interact with it using familiar data frame methods. Trick number 22, create a pivot table. If you often create data frames like the one above, you might find it more convenient to use the pivot table method instead. With a pivot table, you directly specify the index, the columns, the values, and the aggregation function. An added benefit of a pivot table is that you can easily add row and column totals by setting margins equal true. This shows the overall survival rate, as well as the survival rate by sex and passenger class. Finally, you can create a cross-tabulation just by changing the aggregation function from mean to count. This shows the number of records that appear in each combination of categories. Trick number 23, convert continuous data into categorical data. Let's take a look at the age column from the Titanic dataset. It's currently continuous data but what if you wanted to convert it into categorical data? One solution would be to label the age ranges, such as child, young adult, and adult. The best way to do this is by using the cut function. This assigned each value to a bin with a label. Ages 0 to 18 were assigned the label child. Ages 18 to 25 were assigned the label young adult and ages 25 to 99 were assigned the label adult. Notice that the data type is now category and the categories are automatically ordered. Thanks to Rafi Islam for this trick. Trick number 24, change display options. Let's take another look at the Titanic data set. Notice that the age column has one decimal place and the fare column has four decimal places. What if you wanted to standardize the display to use two decimal places? You can use the set option function. The first argument is the name of the option, and the second argument is a Python format string. You can see that age and fare are now using two decimal places. Note that this did not change the underlying data, only the display of the data. You can also reset any option back to its default. There are many more options you can specify in a similar way. 
Thanks to Jeff Hale for this trick. Trick number 25, style a data frame. The previous trick is useful if you want to change the display of your entire notebook. However, a more flexible and powerful approach is to define the style of a particular data frame. Let's return to the stocks data frame. We can create a dictionary of format strings that specifies how each column should be formatted. And then we can pass it to the data frame's style.format method. Notice that the date is now in month, day, year format. The closing price has a dollar sign and the volume has commas. We can apply more styling by chaining additional methods. We've now hidden the index, highlighted the minimum close value in red, and highlighted the maximum close value in green. Here's another example of data frame styling. The volume column now has a background gradient to help you easily identify high and low values. And here's one final example. There's now a bar chart within the volume column and a caption above the data frame. Note that there are many more options for how you can style your data frame. Thanks to Chris Moffitt for this trick. Now for a bonus trick, profile a data frame. Let's say that you've got a new data set and you want to quickly explore it without too much work. There's a separate package called Pandas Profiling that is designed for this purpose. First, you have to install it with Conda or Pip. Once that's done, you import Pandas Profiling. Then, simply run the Profile Report function and pass it any data frame. It returns an interactive HTML report. The first section is an overview of the data set and a list of possible issues with the data. The next section gives a summary of each column. You can click Toggle Details for even more information. The third section shows a heat map of the correlation between columns. And the fourth section shows the head of the data set. Thanks to Siddhartha, Hasma Balaj, and Subham Biswas for this trick. All right, it's your turn. Let me know in the comments section below which one of these tricks you're most excited to start using. And if you have a favorite pandas trick that I did not mention, also let me know in the comments. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.